Good morning. Uh, I'm John Welch, the Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, uh, yet another installment in our uh, uh, COVID-19 series. This one is called Surviving COVID-19, our, our fifth installment, The Future of Globalization, Trade and Growth. Uh, this one, we already did one on trade, but that was much more practical. This is more from a macroeconomic standpoint. I first wanted to wish you the very best and health. We hope you're doing well, staying at home and keeping healthy. Uh, second, I wanted to th give special thanks to the Fundação Dom Cabral, one of the top 10 business schools in the world that's located in Minas Gerais. And we have the illustrious Carlos Braga here, who is a professor uh, at the FTC. We are partners with, with FTC. Um, and without further ado, I'll just quickly introduce our three panelists and turn it over to the first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Carlos Alberto Primo Braga, uh, who's an adjunct professor at, Don Cab at Fundação Don Cabral. He uh, has an illustrious career, having worked at, most recently at IMT and the Avon Institute in Lausanne, uh, many years at the World Bank, including being the head of the World Bank in Paris, uh, and also uh, a professor, one of the other panelists. Um, uh, that other panelist is Douglas Lippold. Dr. D Douglas Lippold and I were, were colleagues at HSBC. He is the chief trade economist at HSBC. Uh, we used to be at the OECD, was a student of Carlos when he was there, getting his PhD, and really one of the foremost uh, authorities on trade, especially from the financial side. And finally, we have Laura Rabinowitz, uh, one of our members. We had her on a prior uh, uh, <laughs> webinar. Uh, she specializes in trade, uh, especially it's the kind of things you hear about, Super 301, et cetera, and she'll be our third panel. So without further ado, let me turn the microphone off over to Carlos Primo Braga. Carlos? John, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with you all. Uh, I'm going to focus on one of the questions that the Chamber posed to us, which which was how the international trading and world economies evolve and what are the implications for globalization of the current COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I'm gonna focus on two aspects, why this time is different, and then the implications for trade and economic relations between Brazil and the United States. As you know, uh, we are living in a moment that it's characterized by many, many fake news. So, so let me share with you one. There is a famous quote that it's attributed as a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. No doubt we are living in interesting times. But the interesting aspect is this quote it's not Chinese. Actually, it can be traced back to the 19th century in the United Kingdom, and more recently, uh, in the 1930s, to a British diplomat that mentioned in a book that he had heard that such a curse existed in China. But in reality, this began to go around and actually, it became very famous because Bob Kennedy, in a speech in Cape Town, in the University of Cape Town, used this quote as a Chinese curse. Why I'm saying this? Because it still applies, but it's not a Chinese curse. But it's a good example how, in a world globalized and with flows of information, we can get access to very different information from very different sources. But there is one thing that we know for sure. This is an interesting time. There are some parallels in history in terms of impact of pandemics. Of course, we are not expecting anything like uh, the impact of the Spanish flu, where 40 to 50 million people died between 1918 and 1920 and we had an impact in income per capita of more than 5% in the countries most affected by the influenza. But definitely we are already in a situation that uh, characterizes one of the most dramatic pandemics of the last 100 years. 
Now, if we look at the recent history, there has been a dramatic change in terms of our expectations of how the world operates. If we go back to the 1990s, uh, we were talking about the end of history, the early 2000s, we are talking about the world is flat, the power of technology, but in reality, globalization, meaning the growing interdependence in terms of economic information, knowledge flows and capital flows around the world, suffer a series of shocks over the last 20 years, beginning with September 11 and its implications with respect to travel, with respect to the health, the economic health of airlines, going on to the global financial crisis. And uh, since then, we had a dramatic decrease in terms of international capital flows. By 2019, we are still roughly 40% below uh, the levels of uh, foreign direct investment and portfolio flows that we saw at the peak before the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008. And more recently, we have seen a series of impacts with the rise of protectionist attitudes often associated with populist governments around the world. 2016 is a very important date in this context with the decision of the UK to vote in favor of Brexit, the election of Donald Trump. And since then, we have seen a significant increase in trade tensions around the world. Now, if we compare the global financial crisis with the great lockdown that we are living nowadays, there are some similarities, but there are many differences. In the case of the global financial crisis, the recovery of the American economy, for instance, the largest economy in the world, is started already in the middle of 2009. So the recession that uh, we, we can trace back to the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, was of short duration in relative terms. There were ripple effects, but it was essentially a financial crisis that affected mainly industrialized countries. Just to give you a point of reference, in the case of Brazil, for instance, GDP growth in 2009 was minus 0 0.2. Uh, the US was minus 2.4. And China, remained a very dynamic economy in the middle of the global financial crisis, growing in 2009 something like 8.7%. Nowadays, we are living a different situation in the sense that the crisis started with a supply shock, with the lockdown in Hubei province, uh, housed to many, many companies associated with global value chains. And this began to affect production lines around the world from Hyundai in uh, Korea to Nissan in Japan and so on and so forth. And as the diseases spread around the world, the next epicenter being countries like Italy, Spain, uh, we had additional supply shocks. And more recently, of course, the epicenter is in the United States. All of this then was combined with a dramatic increase in uncertainty and the financial implications of this uncertainty for a country like Brazil, but for most emerging economies, is well pictured in what is happening, for instance, with capital flight from these economies and the impact on foreign exchange rates around the world. The real, for instance, has depreciated dramatically over the last two months vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. But not only the real, we can see this for many emerging economies. And one thing that is still to come is exactly the impact of these financial shocks in terms of a sovereign debt around the world. There are the usual suspects, 
like Argentina, that was already in the middle of renegotiations of its sovereign debt, but all over the world, particularly least developed countries, we are going to see major, major problems in the coming months. I used to be the director of economic policy and debt of the World Bank between 2008 and 2010, and I can tell you that the numbers are pretty scary. So this takes us to the question, how are we going to get out of this crisis? And of course, for sure, sooner or later we will get out, but uh, nobody has a precise estimate of the duration of this public health shock and macroeconomic effects that we are living right now. So not only we all have become amateur epidemiologists, but also we all have been playing around with geometry. Are those that are very optimist and believe that once the health scare is controlled, either because we have proper therapeutic uh, solutions or because a vaccine is introduced, uh, that will have a very rapid uh, response in economies. So they bet on a V-type response of our economy. Others believe that this will be a more protracted situation. I myself believe that it's going to be a W in the following sense. Not only we are going to see other uh, episodes when the lockdown is uh, alleviated and inevitably this will happen all over the world uh, and we'll have new episodes search of the COVID-19 and then lockdown will be introduced again till either we achieve uh, immunity in terms of uh, societies at large or a vaccine is introduced. But on top of that, the financial implications of the crisis are going to become much harder in the coming months. Just to give you some numbers, in the case of Brazil, uh, roughly 49% of the large companies cannot withstand more than three months of lockdown without going significantly into debt. And of course, the picture is much more dramatic for small and medium enterprise. So what all of this means for trade, to conclude, well, uh, the WTO, is estimating uh, a significant shock in 2020. Merchandise trade is expected to decline between 12.9% in terms of volume up to 31.9%. This is the most pessimistic scenario. So much more dramatic than what we saw in 2009. But what is particularly uh, different this time is the role of global value chains and how these global value chains, of course, transmit these shocks around the world. And that's why I bet on a W type of recovery in the sense that although China seems to have control uh, COVID-19, at least in the short term, it's now facing the impact of the demand for its products in the rest of the world, given the, the, the change in the app center around the world. But another aspect that it's also fundamental to understand what is going on is what is happening with the service sector, be it because of the implications of the lockdown for labor, be it for tourism, for travel, for instance, purchasing manager indices for services trade have declined dramatically, something that we hadn't seen before and much more dramatic than we had seen uh, in 2009. On top of that, some countries are imposing export controls on products, uh, pharmaceutical products, but it's also true that many countries are adopting trade facilitation uh, measures to try to facilitate access to these inputs. 
Brazil, among G20 countries, has one of the highest MFN tariffs for pharmaceuticals uh, and uh, masks, etc., that are important in the context of this pandemic. Uh, the average is something like 9.8%. Only India has <clears throat> higher MFN tariffs. Well, recently, the Brazilian government has significantly decreased these tariffs for roughly 300 products. So this will help. But we still remain significantly affected by export controls around the world. So to conclude, what is the future? We'll continue to have a tension between policies that are going to become more protectionist. Uh, there is inevitably, as in any episode associated with pandemics, a xenophobic trace in the reactions of governments around the world. But at the same time, technology will continue to push uh, the process of globalization ahead. But if there is one thing that I would bet is that we are going to put much more emphasis on resilience of global value chains rather than uh, efficiency per se. And this will promote more emphasis on regional value chains rather than global value chains. And we also probably are going to see increasing uh, investment by the leading trading powers in the world in terms of uh, augmenting their capacity to have well-organized spheres of influence. I'm not saying that this is good, actually probably will create more tensions, but we can see this already happening, be it in the case of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Western Hemisphere, be it with respect to China and its policies uh, in East Asia in general. So this is a world that uh, is going to emerge from this crisis with uh, many, many differences vis-a-vis the kind of globalization that we saw in the past. But those that are betting on the end of globalization, I would just mention Mark Twain when he was in 1897 in London and uh, he got ill and the news that he had died began to circulate. And then a journalist asked him about how he would react uh, about this news. And he said, reports of my debt have been greatly exaggerated. I would say the same applies to globalization at this moment, but definitely it will be a different type of globalization. In the case of Brazil-US relations, let's see, for instance, how it evolves the question of uh, the recent uh, uh, communique from USTR and the, the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Economics about the new efforts to have an agreement on trade rules, transparency, focusing on regulations and trade facilitation. Uh, this is very recent. It is still early days to say if this is going to evolve in something more uh, significant, but it's an interesting development. I'll stop here, John. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, just, uh, I think there was one other episode of uh, Collapse in World similar to this, uh, and that was in the 1930s. Um, uh, certainly the collapse there, maybe not in services, but it is of the same magnitude and uh, with ramifications, but it's good to hear that there's some uh, good reactions. And with that, I think we'll uh, turn to Dr. Douglas Lippold. Uh, Doug? Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, well, uh, good day, everyone. I'm, I'm very pleased to have a chance to share with you some of the research that we've had ongoing at uh, HSBC, looking at questions related to innovation. So, uh, as Carlos just laid out, the uh, picture of the global economy, uh, including some commentary on 
openness, um, I'd like to highlight uh, why that matters in this particular uh, crisis. You know, I was reading uh, this morning, there's an interesting posting I th that came from uh, Yale University, a number of Latin American former presidents and government officials and academics signed a uh, joint um, letter, including President Cardoso, Ernesto Zedillo and others, uh, Ricardo Hausman and such. And they concluded with a statement that really grabbed my attention. And they said, mutual trust, transparency, reason remain the best guidepost in these uncertain times for responding to the COVID crisis. And I really like that point about the role that reason um, plays in this. We're dealing with a novel illness um, and that novelty means that existing tools are not proving adequate uh, to rapidly uh, reining in the, uh, diffu the dissemination of this illness around the world and treating it. And therefore we need innovation. And uh, that fits in with a line of research we've had at um, HSBC looking at um, the expenditure in the private sector on R&D. Uh, about half of the research and development expenditure in the world goes via the private sector. And we've um, benefited actually at um, HSBC uh, from uh, new data compiled by the European Union, looking at the top 2,500 firms each year in terms of R&D expenditure. And we've drawn on those data to build a, a very large database. Why does this matter? Well, businesses invest in R&D to differentiate their products, to add new characteristics, new qualities, um, to cut costs, that is to improve price, uh, or to raise brand awareness that provides a competitive edge. But in this case of a health emergency, um, uh, it turns out that that mobilization of capacity for research and development also has a direct benefit for um, humanity. And um, uh, I'll get into some of the specifics on that um, shortly in terms of health and welfare. Um, we did a study uh, back in November looking at how openness affects the diffusion of innovation. It turns out that globally innovation is concentrated in just a, uh, uh, perhaps 15 countries or so account for the majority of the expenditure. And therefore it's important in terms of global openness, um, uh, which provides uh, access to the world to the kinds of innovation that emerge. And businesses that invest in R&D benefit from this and that they utilize openness to um, sell their products around the world. And uh, just to give you a number uh, on this, we estimated that about a 1% increase in business expenditure on R&D was associated with a 0.2% growth in the exports um, in the next year. So businesses saw a direct uh, innovation return. Okay, so that's kind of setting the stage. Um, and now we've updated this using this large database, firm level data, uh, 15,000 uh, observations over five years. Um, and uh, to look specifically at the issue of this COVID-19 crisis. Um, and uh, uh, well, what did we find? We found that in the uh, health sectors, in pharmaceutical products, in healthcare equipment and services, that there's particular concentration. Uh, these sectors are innovation, innovation intensive, but even compared to other um, leading sectors, such as uh, electronics, for example. Um, pharmaceutical products um, are uh, at the top of the league charts, uh, looking across 37 different sectors. So there's this concentration of innovation. About 20% of the expenditure that we identified is concentrated in health, um, expenditure in R&D is concentrated in the health-related sectors. Right. So. There's this concentration uh, across sectors in the health sectors. And when you look to see um, geographically where this is taking place, it turns out that about 10 countries 
account for 90% of the private sector uh, expenditure on R&D. Um, if you look uh, at pharmaceutical products, you see the US, China, India, uh, UK, and Japan coming up in the tops of the charts. If you look at um, uh, uh, health uh, care equipment and services, you see the US, Germany, Japan, China, and the UK uh, coming up at the tops of the charts. Um, in pharmaceutical products, there's a, a mention, an honorable mention for Switzerland, which has the world leading firm in terms of R&D expenditure in 2019, which is uh, Roche. And if you look at healthcare equipment, uh, it turns out that Medtronic, um, which is based, uh, uh, registered base uh, is in Ireland. Uh, also turns up uh, at the uh, worthy of an honorable mention there. So we've got this geographic concentration and in innovation uh, led by the private sector. And uh, it turns out that that matters in terms of resolving this present crisis. Um, why am I saying that? Well, the private sector has responded um, given the potential for um, uh, for leveraging their investment in R&D, um, the private sector has engaged in new forms of collaboration. And this is important because uh, an idea can be used time and again. Ideas are not exclusive. And by pooling uh, ideas through collaborative channels, businesses can uh, contribute to development of innovation to respond to this crisis. Um, uh, which can then be used time and again in as it's diffused around the world to tackle the challenge. And businesses have partnered with government agencies, with nonprofit institutions, and with academic institutions. Um, they've, um, uh, in some cases, chosen to relax some of their uh, intellectual property um, uh, rights uh, or to collaborate in innovative ways that permit access to their intellectual property. And um, this is delivering results. I saw um, a report uh, as of the 30th of uh, March, we've had 41 diagnostic tests that have um, are related to COVID-19 that have already cleared regulatory approvals. We've had five vaccine candidates launched in human trials. And we've had 23 uh, treatments for the COVID-19 that are also in clinical human trials. Um, and the vast majority of these numbers uh, are uh, led by private sector businesses um, working in collaboration with these other partners around. Now, uh, there is a, a benefit to humanity from this innovation and its diffusion. Uh, and uh, I also expect that these firms are learning new ways of uh, conducting the innovation and they'll be able to leverage this going forward. We know from looking at these data um, that business investment in R&D uh, is highly significantly related with subsequent growth in net sales. Um, and we know that um, one of the reasons for the geographic concentration in businesses um, and innovation is uh, policy frameworks that countries that offer openness to trade, countries that offer uh, appropriate levels of protection for intellectual property rights, um, uh, countries that offer a degree of economic policy certainty, that they tend to be more attractive to businesses engaged in long-term thinking that, um, that drives investment in innovation. Um, so uh, uh, that's uh, an important thing. As Carlos mentioned, we've had this pushback um, uh, uh, in terms of populism, we've had uh, countries around the world engaging in efforts to uh, uh, impede exports of essential healthcare products um, uh, related to treatment of the COVID pandemic. Um, Simon Evanet of the uh, Global Trade Alert Project at the University of St. Gallen um, on the 10th of April noted that he, his team had cataloged 107 different export control measures that had been put in place at that, at that point. Some 89 countries had been implicated in one or more of these measures. Um, you know, on the other hand, we've had countries 
including some of these same countries, liberalizing their import regimes and uh, trying to open their markets to global supply. But um, this is an unbalanced approach. And if we have supplies uh, on the exporting side being constrained, uh, liberalizing the import side may uh, not do the trick. We need a balanced approach, which means a degree of global collaboration will be required. Latin America, I have to say, the Latin American countries are not turning up uh, in terms of uh, implementation of export controls. And there has been some trade facilitation, some tariff reductions, as, as Carlos has highlighted. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the WTO reported on the 3rd of April that um, uh, quite a few Latin American countries maintain relatively high levels of protection on healthcare products that are needed for this for responding to this global pandemic. Um, and uh, just to be uh, fair and balanced across LATAM, I'd like to note that the WTO report highlights Central America, the Dominican Republic and Haiti as not being, uh, as being relatively open uh, with respect to those tariffs. It's rather the South American, uh, some of the South American countries that, such as Brazil that have at least until the recent rel relaxation in Brazil uh, that have been uh, maintaining relatively high impediments to the access to the kind of healthcare products that we need to see. So just to uh, sum up, I mean, we're facing a global challenge. It's a novel challenge. It requires innovation to respond to it. Um, and we've seen uh, that um, uh, businesses have been stepping up uh, and uh, not in isolation, but working rather in collaboration and uh, we're seeing this in the data and it's beginning to bear fruit, this uh, collaboration. Um, and uh, um, I think that um, uh, it's signaling to us that openness is gonna be, uh, uh, and cooperation globally um, are gonna be important elements if we're going to resolve this um, uh, challenge in an expeditious fashion. And I'll stop right there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, before we move on, just uh, three things. First, um, if you have questions, please put them in the tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, second, uh, we thought we were going to have a live stream on YouTube and Facebook, but for technical reasons, we have not been able to um, provide that. And thirdly, the, I, we didn't go into long uh, introductions because uh, there is a link on your reminder and uh, there'll be a link on the website to the bios of everybody here. So um, we're going to turn to Laura Rabinowitz of Greenberg Taurig, uh, who's in the trenches, at least on the trade side. We've heard uh, uh, some encouraging things, certainly from Doug on the innovation and, uh, side, and also the, the framework under which innovation will, uh, will work better, and that's in more open markets, and sort of a mixed uh, set of uh, messages about what countries are doing in terms of that. But uh, we, we turn to Laura to see what we are, what's happening in the United States. Certainly, uh, we heard reports of gel being let, held at the border and other medical equipment. In addition to that, my friends in Toronto are saying, do you want any masks? You know, the N95, we can get them at the, the local drugstore. We have no problems with shortages on these things. So let me, turn, let me uh, uh, turn it over to Laura. Laura, thank you very much for being part of this. Sure, thank you, John, and uh, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, so as John mentioned, you know, I'm going to speak from a U.S. perspective and sort of give a backdrop of where we are. Um, you know, this administration has been, you know, very aggressive with the use of tariffs as a negotiating tool. Um, they have a stated goal of bringing manufacturing back to the United States. You know, if we can remember you know, pre-pandemic, <laughs> hard for us to remember. Um, the Trump administration had put tariffs on the importations of steel, aluminum, and the products of China and the and specific products from the EU as well. Um, so starting with Section 232 for the tariffs on uh, steel and aluminum, um, uh, the, the president um, asked the Commerce Department to study whether um, imports of steel and aluminum were threatening our national security. Um, that was under the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, and the Commerce Department did that review, and then in March of 2018, they instituted additional tariffs on imports of, tar of steel and aluminum, and, that, and that's global, that's not just from uh, 
China or the EU, but it's that that was a global and then that system has morphed into a combination of quotas and steel and some countries have been taken off. Um, of course, in December of 2019, uh, the president announced that no additional tariffs on um, Brazil's steel and aluminum for imports into the US. And then um, the Trump administration also used, has used uh, Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974, which is a little, a little known provision. Um, and so starting in July of 2018, the US imposed 25% additional tariffs on three tranches of 250 billion worth of Chinese merchandise imported into the US. And then the fourth tranche in September of 2019 at 15%. Um, and that is, of course, on top of the general rate of duty. So this has been quite onerous for importers of this covers raw materials, uh, components, um, tools, machinery, and finished products. Um, and then pursuant to the phase one deal between the US and China, that rate was reduced from 15% to 7.5% in uh, February of 2020. Now, um, the imposition of these additional tariffs started um, as a response to uh, China's uh, intellectual property regulations and forced technology requirements. Um, and then the Trump administration broadened the discussion to um, agricultural products, currency manipulation, and cyber theft, um, which I don't think anyone would argue um, with that there were issues with those policies, the Chinese policies on that. Um, to date, the U.S. Customs has collected 49.6 billion on um, these 301 tariffs that's on products from China. So as I said, importers of components and finished products since July of 2018 really have been dealing with these increased tariffs. 25% is, is quite a significant burden, um, and they've been doing you know, lots of efforts to mitigate this additional tariff burden. Um, the uh, US Trade Representative did institute an exclusion process where importers could request exclusions for specific products. Those exclusions, um, at first, uh, the USTR was granting about a third of the requests. Um, now it's, it's way down from that. Um, and those uh, exclusions that were granted were good for, are good for one year. Um, and it's been quite difficult to get extensions. They've granted uh, very few extension requests. There's now also an additional exclusion process for PPE and other medical products, um, and those seem to be fast-tracked, and they're um, issuing those lists periodically as well, so that, that's good. And those are due um, by the end of June. That's when that process will close. And then in terms of the EU, um, there's been a long-running, as, as people know, there's a long-running dispute between the US and the EU on subsidies to Airbus. And then finally, in October of 2019, uh, the USTR imposed additional duties on certain products from the EU, and those are 25%, um, and then on aircraft, it's 15%. And those are country-specific and product-specific. So it's really important for companies you know, importing into the US um, to, look at those, to look at those lists. Uh, and the USTR has announced that they may revise those percentages based on actions of the EU countries. And of course, those cover all the good things that we import from the EU, cheese, fruit, meat, olives, coffee, Irish whiskey, and uh, scotch. So it's, um, in any case, so, so far, um, the US has collected 500 million in those duties. Of course, those only went into effect in the fall. And then, you know, as I said, the, the Trump administration has been very aggressive with the use of duties. Um, and then there was in the last few weeks sort of a tease whether there might be some duty deferral for, for companies and, or maybe for struggling companies or maybe across the board, just as the IRS has done with tax payments, those being deferred for 90 days. And then finally yesterday, um, the president issued an executive order that there would be a delay in duty payments for companies suffering significant financial hardship. Um, and that means that um, they have 60% of their gross receipts compared to 2019. And those are due to government ordered closures in their business. Um, it's, it's limited, it's only good for entries in March and April of 2020, um, and does not cover anti-dumping, countervailing duties, or the um, duties on 
a steel aluminum or the products from China or the EU. So it is limited, but it is something, um, and there will be a number of, I think particularly with a broad reading of the executive order, um, a number of companies will be able to take advantage of that. Um, and then as, um, as Carlos mentioned, um, there are export controls. The US has um, instituted export controls on medical supplies. Um, exports now need uh, FEMA authorization prior to export. Um, and as we've seen, you know, lots of other countries have done that as well, um, as Carlos mentioned. Um, interestingly, uh, a bipartisan group in Congress uh, recently wrote uh, to the Chinese government requesting that their export controls on medical products um, be more limited, not, a, not as broad as they were originally drafted. So I would say that is sort of the, the backdrop to the pandemic. And now we have this, you know, the intersection of the pandemic and US trade policy. Um, the administration has a view um, that the US has a strategic vulnerability because we're, we're not manufacturing in the US. Um, and there is an importance to manufacturing masks and ventilators in the US. Um, and they would say that the pandemic has proved just that. Um, you know, so what what will the future bring? You know, I've been talking about the Trump administration, but I would say there's there's bipartisan support for bringing supply chains back to the U.S. right now. Um, Americans seem to like that Brooks Brothers is manufacturing masks and and scrubs in the U.S. GM is is manufacturing ventilators. Um, Debbie Dingell, a congresswoman from Michigan, a Democrat, um, said that the pandemic shows shows us that the U.S. does need to um, support domestic manufacturing um, and that we shouldn't be as reliant on China for, for medicine and medical supplies. Um, you know, I mean, I, I really agree um, that supply chains, to make them resilient, it really is best to diversify, um, but I'm not sure that's where we're at in the U.S. right now. Um, I read, I, I couldn't verify this, but I read that ventilators have up to 19 pieces, 900 pieces. Um, I don't think any country could manufacture from raw materials all the 900 pieces made to, to make a ventilator. Um, and it, it, they're really important to source those globally. Um, but the Trump administration has a clear policy of trying to repatriate um, supply chains, increased domestic manufacturing, and I think we'll see some legislation from Congress supporting that, you know, once they're, um, you know, once the crisis of the pandemic has ebbed a bit. Um, and then just to, to circle back on the duties, I think no matter who's in the White House in 2021, um, I don't think those additional duties will be going away so fast. So thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Yes, it's uh, those that are speaking out are the ones that are heard. Uh, I worked on NAFTA years ago when I was at uh, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and worked on trade before that. And surprising to me, but uh, it's very clear that uh, protectionism, protectionism is bipartisan, but also is free trade. And in the NAFTA vote, we saw that when uh, the Clinton administration put into place a uh, Republican agenda. Uh, and right, usually if uh, the other party's in, in, in place and they take a certain trade stance, uh, the other party's uh, members that uh, agree with it tend to keep quiet. <laughs> so maybe we have a silent, uh, um, or at least a, another faction that is also bipartisan and is for trade. And we've seen anecdotal evidence of that. I don't haven't seen any polls in Congress at all to see what that is, and certainly, with the Trump administration, we've returned to the Republicans being more protectionist than the Democrats, which was the way it was until uh, President Reagan. So uh, we'll see what we get from this. But certainly, uh, thank you for giving us not only the outline of where we are, but also the sense in Washington, and, and it, uh, Laura. Um, maybe I'll turn just quickly to the other two, uh, to Douglas, Doug and Carlos. What they sense, I mean, we went through actual actions what is your sense in Europe, Doug, and what is your sense, uh, Carlos, in, in Latin America, but also in Europe and in Asia about what, which side of this thing is, is winning out, especially uh, the complementary parts that uh, Doug, 
both Doug and Carlos talked about that are intellectual property rights protection and property protection? Well, uh, in terms of the tensions and uh, the demand for protectionist actions for redesign of global value chains, this is a reality that is affecting everybody. Uh, it affects much more a country like Mexico than a country like Brazil, because Brazil, because of its trade policies, traditionally has been uh, not that involved with global value chains. So I do agree that there will be uh, lots of pressure towards increased resilience in terms of uh, domestic production, uh, particularly to face crisis situations like the one that we are living in right now. But one thing that I would like to point out is the following. If you look at the global financial crisis, one of the main implications of the global financial crisis was a significant uh, demand for increase in terms of the level of capital uh, in the financial sector to avoid the kind of uh, dramatic deleveraging that we observed in 2009, 2010, and the contamination of uh, many companies around the world. So we have seen, be it at the level of countries like the United States, uh, many European countries, but also at multilateral level, uh, reflecting new versions of the Basel regulations, pressure for an increase in terms of a capital position of financial agents. So the same thing, the same uh, lesson can be applied in the context of the current pandemics. Countries like Switzerland and Finland have over time created significant stockpiles of products to respond to this type of crisis. So they are much better prepared to confront uh, a pandemic than other countries. Uh, so I will see also uh, more attention to this question of strategic stocks uh, in areas like, for instance, medical equipment around the world. And uh, this is probably much more effective than protectionist measures. Very good. Uh before we go to Doug, uh, please, I want to remind everyone, if they have questions, please put them in the chat at the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, Doug, please weigh in. Right, certainly. Uh, I guess there's, I had three uh, observations here. Um, one is that the uh, change in U.S. policy um, uh, towards a more strident stance um, has certainly, it's been disruptive on certain trade corridors, no doubt as Laura was highlighting on the US-China trade corridor in particular, but um, also with respect to Europe and other trade partners, um, including Brazil in the case of um, uh, steel and aluminum, where there's been on again, off again, uh, national security um, actions uh, um, in terms of the uh, Trade Expansion Act of 1962, section uh, 262. Um, so, uh, but here's the, here's the uh, deal with this that I think may be an element of an encouragement. And that is, we've seen, uh, as President Trump came into office, U.S. popular support for this open trade stance, for the engagement in trade, um, uh, and uh, people reporting an economic benefit from trade, um, according to Gallup, it was about 53% of the population, so just a thin majority. Um, now, if you fast forward three years into the administration, something like 76% of the American population say that they see trade as an economically beneficial um, uh, uh, policy instrument. And 
So there is this upside to this strident stance is that Americans feel like trade has become more fair. Now, uh, we may disagree with the tariffs as I do, <laughs> with some of the tariffs anyhow, um, but um, uh, there is this populist uh, uh, benefit here in that support for trade is rising in the US. And I hope that that will give policymakers some space to undo some of the damage they've done with these trade distorting measures that have been put in place. Uh, that's the first observation. The second is that global value chains were already shifting even before Trump, but, uh, but with the arrival on the scene of President Trump and, and the rise in protectionist actions, not just in the US, but in other countries, um, we've seen global value chains already uh, evolving. Businesses began to um, uh, look for some redundancy and some optionality in the way they structure value chains um, uh, in light of um, not just political actions, but also uh, other disruptions. The tsunami in Southeast um, Asia that hit Indonesia um, disrupted, um, disrupted um, some uh, value chains, um, flooding in the Priyatal Valley in the central of uh, center of Thailand, disrupted auto production in Japan. This, these types of uh, developments were already driving firms to uh, restructure value chains, uh, including um, uh, the uh, emergence of technology as another factor and uh, the demand for quick turnarounds. So we were seeing not just redundancy, but also some regionalization already happening before. Um, and uh, uh, the idea of having a fragmented production process, but also uh, pressure uh, for quick turnaround, uh, that was driving businesses already to shorten value chains. And you see hubs emerging uh, around Asia or in North America and NAFTA or within Europe, where those quick turnarounds um, could be achieved. Um, and then the, uh, the third thing is, uh, I just wanted to highlight that on trade policy, um, it's not just a, um, a game of the um, quad countries, the, the Europe, uh, the US, Canada, and Japan. Um, we've seen some pushback against the protectionism uh, around the world. Um, and uh, in the case of COVID, we have a um, Singapore and New Zealand leading a group now of seven countries whose ministers have signed on to um, a declaration affirming the importance of openness in responding, in pooling resources to respond to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and we've seen this kind of action also um, at the WTO as businesses, um, as businesses, as countries um, we'll work together to find a response to the blockage in the dispute settlement mechanism, the appeals body, as um, Europe, Canada, and another um, uh, dozen countries or so have, have um, developed a methodology for dealing with um, this blockage in a workaround fashion um, at the WTO. So there, there is some pushback. It's not just a, uh, a story of rising protectionism. Um, there is a, there are some competing countercurrents um, that are out there that give me some hope uh, for openness going forward. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, the question here: uh, There's a disconnect on uh, where each country is on the pandemic curve. For instance, Mexico is well behind the United States, uh, so there there will be a disconnect also on the regional value change. Uh, U.S. may not restart producing cars until Mexico restarts its economy, for example, because of the integrated nature. Uh, there also, we have this amazing situation where the May contract on oil, on WTI oil is trading very negative. Uh, how do these figure into your assessments? And I'll, we'll start with Laura on this and move from there. Thank you. You're on mute, Laura. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Yes, I mean, that shows the, the interconnectedness and um, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, the NAFTA, the new NAFTA, um, uh, I'm in favor, you know. <laughs> um, so that's absolutely right. That, um, I mean, that shows the, the globalization and here it's a, a regional for North America. 
um, absolutely. You know, um, once the once the the U.S. auto industry won't open up until Mexico is all, is open. So yes, I mean that's you know as Doug was saying, it, 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 re, certainly regions have to work together. And yeah, I, think I, that, I think that will happen. Oddly, for a while, I used to use Mexican industrial production. It was a month with a month lag to U.S. industrial production. It was a leading indicator uh, 10 years after NAFTA was put in place of U.S. manufacturing. That broke down later, but it certainly was uh, clear that they were upstream. Yeah, and I, I would also say that after the um, imposition of the tariffs on China, you know, Mexico was, was a big winner of that, uh, of that tariff war. Uh, many countries were... Uh, looking to move to Mexico, particularly the Mequiadora. So it's good for the region. I just wanted to also mention something back to in Doug's, uh, he's so optimistic, um, it, Doug's uh, comments earlier. In terms of uh, diversification of supply chains, and I think that's where companies really were going. I mean, they were trying not to be just in China and really to diversify. And, and one issue um, that I thought was going to be the most important issue for companies importing into the U.S. and a key issue for U.S. Customs is labor and the use of forced labor. Um, customs is being very aggressive about that now and issuing withhold release orders. And so that was um, an issue for company in determining where to source and being very careful about that. And that comes not just from um, the rise of social, you know, corporate social responsibility, but also um, U.S. Customs and their focus on, on forced labor. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, uh, I mean, I think this restarting issue that um, uh, that the uh, that Fernando raised um, in his question is is a, a really important one. I mean, we've seen this, uh, and Carlo meant, Carlos mentioned this in his opening um, that. Um, the, uh, gl the global uh, trade flows were disrupted by China's lockdown um, in January. <laughs> um, uh, as China came back online uh, in late February and, and March, um, uh, we saw demand disrupted in key destination markets for Chinese production in, in Western Europe and now in the U.S. And this um, uh, this um, timing issue um, is um, a, a challenging one in terms of getting the, the uh, to prime the pump to start the machine functioning well again going forward. Um, and, and so it also underscores the importance of this uh, business thinking about resilience and diversification, um, which was already good advice pre-crisis, but I think going forward businesses um, that I'm talking to are definitely thinking about um, being agile uh, to be uh, in terms of their ability to respond to shocks um, and then uh, resilient in, in terms of having some redundancy and some some uh, alternatives and some optionality in the way they structure their value chains um, and I'll leave it there thanks. Um, Carlos you certainly as you said we've all become uh, experts in pandemics and the, and the spread of viruses, uh, at least the mathematics. But it seems like you've done uh, quite a bit on this already. Uh, what do you think about the timing, number one, uh, of the different stages across the globe and what the, how that uh, the implications are? Uh, and second, what about uh, the risks, especially in the southern hemisphere, of a flare-up come September, a re-flare-up come September, October? and the implications for trade and production? Well, no doubt we are seeing the waves of uh, COVID-19 gradually impacting the whole world. Uh, more than 180 countries by now have uh, already experienced infections and deaths associated with COVID-19. Where different countries are in this process is, of course, it depends when the initial impact is started. It depends on policies that governments adopted. So in the case of Brazil, for instance, we were relatively fortunate 
in the sense that uh, the initial impact happened more than a month after uh, it was already a major public health issue in Europe and in China. But uh, it will also depend a lot on the kind of policies adopted by governments in terms of social distancing, uh, how draconian are the measures of lockdown. So in a federation like Brazil, uh, the situation actually in Brazil is very similar to the United States, not in terms of uh, deaths and infections at this point in time, but in terms of conflicts between the federal government and the states. So although many states and municipalities have adopted policies of lockdown with, which are more or less strict depending on the situation of each state, uh, the federal government has sent, let's say, different messages about these policies. Now, what we know from experience with past pandemics is that those localities that adopted more draconian lockdown policies uh, typically came out of the crisis with better economic performances than the ones that adopted more loose policies of social distancing. And this has a lot to do with the level of uncertainty faced by economic agents in such circumstances. So no doubt, if you have a draconian policy of uh, social distance, a total lockdown, as the ones that we saw in Hubei province, as the ones that we saw in Lombardy, in Italy, and in parts of Spain, uh, you're going to have a significant economic impact. Here in Brazil, for instance, Sao Paulo, the state of Sao Paulo, where I'm located, has adopted more significant uh, strict rules for social distancing. And uh, this is affecting economic activity, no doubt. But if we look back, for instance, the experience with uh, the Spanish flu uh, in the United States, for, it, for instance, we see that uh, those states that adopted more draconian policies of social distance and municipalities uh, came out of the crisis better than the ones that uh, relax these policies. Now, in economies like Brazil, India, uh, where you have a significant proportion of the population in informality, in the case of Brazil, roughly 40% of the labor market is informal, and it, it's much more difficult for you to implement these policies of lockdown. And this inevitably affects the capacity of uh, flattening uh, the, the curve of the epidemic. Uh, we are seeing already in several states in Brazil, the hospitals and particularly uh, the intensive care units under significant pressure. It's the case of cities like Manaus, states like uh, Fortaleza, and it's also beginning to happen in other regions of the country, like Rio de Janeiro and in São Paulo. So this it will be the major test for, uh, let's say, leadership, both at the state level, municipal level, but also at federal level. One option for you to get out of the lockdown is to adopt a significant level of testing because this would, uh, let's say, allow us to flexibilize the lockdown in a much more efficient manner. Unfortunately, in the case of Brazil, the level of testing is still very limited uh, in, ter in relative terms vis-a-vis -vis the population. So uh, this is an area that governments are working upon. 
but it's a major, major challenge because to do a proper flexibilization, you would need to have a much better uh, sense of those that eventually have achieved immunity, although there is a debate of uh, how long will this immunity last, uh, and those that are infected so that you can impose quarantine in an efficient manner. So this is the kind of debate that uh, we see right now. I would like later to come back to the question of uh, optimism with respect to trade, but I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to come back to this question later. Um, Doug, what are you thinking in terms of the region where you live and so forth in terms of uh, the stage of certainly Europe as well advanced, not quite as advanced as China, but uh, in terms of the implications for trade, you know, it's extraordinary to me that people would come to the conclusion that protectionism is a good thing because we are right now individually uh, autarkic as well. We can't do normal trade with individuals and the cost is massive. So I just wonder where, where your thoughts were in terms of the European region and also sort of in general. Right, well, um, um, we, the, um, uh, some of the uh, countries that were worst hit in Europe are beginning to um, uh, see some leveling off in Southern Europe. Uh, and there's some consideration now to um, uh, finding ways to loosen some of the restrictions that have been put in place to um, uh, limit the contagion. Um, I think Carlos is right, testing is gonna be part of this. Um, and uh, um, we have also in uh, uh, Germany some discussion of this as well. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's interesting, it, I, the impact I think varies by um, the sector here as well, that in terms on the, on the production side, um, we're seeing some service sector functions like, uh, well, let's just pick something at, at random. Uh, let's say people working on trade economics in global financial uh, institutions are able to continue doing their um, uh, work. And to the extent that Western Europe is particularly uh, strong in service sectors, this, uh, a portion of this work has been able to carry forward in a way that um, in a more uh, agrarian or industrial economy um, um, might not be um, uh, feasible. Uh, I think the other thing is that we're seeing a, a continued uh, hit on uh, consumer demand. I mean, um, people's incomes are constrained uh, and uh, uh, because of the lockdown. Um, and I think uh, we're at risk of seeing some businesses negatively affected. And um, this is another aspect of this timing problem <laughs> that if businesses um, uh, do not receive um, targeted uh, support in an adequate manner, we risk seeing some of the productive capacity impaired as we begin to move out of the, uh, of the downturn. Um, in other words, some businesses uh, may be in much, uh, maybe have impaired financial condition or even have gone uh, uh, um, into uh, administration as a consequence of this and may not be in a position to scale back up with the same kind of um, rapidity that one would hope for. You know, that we wind up with a, a longer, uh, a longer um, uh, recovery period than one might have hoped. And there's, so there's some attention to this in Western Europe thinking about the health uh, and, uh, and welfare of the individual enterprises, especially small and medium-sized uh, businesses that have um, less capital uh, available to them to tie them through this um, uh, period of lockdown. So. Very good, thank you. Um, we do have a question from a, uh, an attendee. Um, clearly, this isn't going to be the last pandemic. Uh, we're gonna have future ones, maybe Corona uh, type as we had before with H1N1 uh, and SARS, the original SARS, 
Uh, the question is, is uh, whether globally, how do we improve on security conditions, research labs, et cetera, uh, and to, to deal with uh, future spread of pandemics either through virus or through bacteria. To be fair, Gilead never dismantled their labs after the, H, after the swine flu H1, the last H1N1. And uh, they, that's why they're so far advanced on what they're working on. But I, I'll leave that to you to talk about what do you think the policies for the next pandemic are going to look like? Uh, uh, any of the panelists can, can chime in. Well, I may <clears throat> comment on this. It has become fashionable to talk about uh, COVID-19 as a uh, black swan. I would argue it's, it was not a black swan. A black swan is more the type of unknown, unknown uh, epic episode, like for instance, September 11, like for instance, the attack of Pearl Harbor, like for instance, the Spanish flu at that point in time with the level of knowledge that we had about epidemics. In this case, there were many, many signs that we should be concerned about uh, the possibility of pandemics. And this came even from organizations like the World Health Organization, governments and uh, philanthropic organizations. There is a very interesting video of Bill Gates making a speech about the dangers of a new pandemic a few years ago. So in the case of COVID-19, we are talking about a known unknown, not really a black swan. But the problem with known unknowns is very similar to the Black Swans episode in the sense that uh, you don't have enough information experience to buy insurance against them in an efficient manner. So yes, definitely we are going to see more efforts in the near term because of the dramatic economic, social, and health impact of uh, COVID-19, but uh, memories fade very quickly, okay? So that's why international cooperation in this area is fundamental. And uh, it caused me, uh, let's say, great surprise to see the United States, for instance, suspending uh, its contributions to the World Health Organization, independently of what you think about the efficiency of the activities of the World Health Organization, but in the middle of a pandemic, because that's exactly when you need a process of coordination and sharing of information and trust uh, so that you can cope with the problem. So. Uh, I agree that we are going to see an increase in interest in creating insurance. The World Bank, for instance, has uh, a kind of pandemic bond that it's already becoming active, but uh, the level of COVID-19 uh, will create in the first moment this kind of reaction. If we are going really to act upon it, it will depend a lot on leadership and support for uh, multilateral cooperation, which is something uh, that I would say right now is not uh, in very significant supply, particularly uh, coming from the United States. Um, certainly, uh, aside from it, if we had the best uh, standard worldwide in intellectual property rights, uh, protection, this still has a huge externality uh, uh, part of it, at least in terms of investment. So the pharmaceutical companies have found in, in the SARS and H1N1, as far as I understand it, they geared up their production, their research and investment, et cetera. And by the time they were ready to go, there was enough uh, immunity, herd immunity and so forth that we were already on the, the severe decline. And certainly those two pandemics petered out rather quickly. So they dismantled their research, uh, research um, 
uh, efforts. And clearly, there's some kind of strategy around keeping those research at, at, from the public sector might certainly be in order. Luckily, uh, Gilead kept theirs in place because, as you said, as, as Bill Gates, as everyone on the panel said, this isn't the last one of these. Um, I don't know, uh, Doug or Laura, would you like to uh, um, add something? Well, okay, yeah, I, I guess one thing I would say, I, I, one reason why I'm very, very concerned about um, a fragmentation of markets and, and the erection of um, barriers uh, from a private sector perspective is that it reduces the incentives for businesses to invest in the kind of R&D we need. If you have access to smaller markets because barriers are segmenting the world, um, uh, then the potential return on your investment in innovation is diminished. And that um, creates, the, it reduces the, the incentives to push forward um, and innovation in, in, um, uh, from what they would, from the incentives that would be there in a case of having uh, um, uh, a global trade regime that's open, that provides some baseline rules with respect to intellectual property, uh, as well as um, uh, baseline rules with respect to uh, openness um, uh, in terms of tariff and non-tariff barriers. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, concerned about this. Uh, one other thing is, uh, in this, uh, building on Carlos's point about to sustain innovation efforts, and your point as well, um, uh, John, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, uh, a number of uh, scholars looking at innovation have suggested um, uh, that government use of uh, prizes um, uh, is one way to um, motivate continued academic research in the area of innovation. And uh, so you could, um, by having uh, philanthropic organizations or states um, offering uh, prizes, you could motivate researchers to carry on um, uh, in, the, uh, in their efforts to um, uh, uh, have a, uh, and, and thereby maintain a, a degree of preparedness in the innovation facilities. So uh, with that, thank you. Uh, John. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to say, um, I, I agree with Doug uh, about the deleterious effects of, of trade barriers and the lack of um, multilateral agreement, you know, that does seem to be where we're headed, um, particularly with this administration. Um, I will say that the, the U.S. Trade Representative is still, even during the pandemic, they've made some announcements regarding bilateral agreements and, and looking um, to continue those negotiations, including with Brazil and Japan and the U.K. So hopefully at least those will continue. And so I'm, I'm pleased to see those. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we're coming to the end of our time, so, and we have no more questions from the audience. So let me ask each of the panelists to uh, make a final statement. I know Carlos wanted to move, go back to talking about uh, optimism or, or lack thereof. Um, we'll start off with Carlos. Okay. Uh, so. <clears throat> Doug mentioned uh, some surveys about support for international trade. Uh, I don't remember what was the source, but uh, Pew has done several of these surveys also. And it shows that in general, you still have a strong support for a liberal trading order. Having said that, we all know that the benefits of uh, international trade are diffuse and the vested interests in protectionism are concentrated. So they are much more effective in terms of lobbying in favor of protectionism than the interest of the population at large. So that, again, requires leadership if you are going to move in sustaining a liberal trade order. This administration, I'm talking about the Trump administration, has shown consistently a significant disregard uh, for the role of uh, international organizations. I mentioned the situation 
with respect to the World Health Organization, but even more dramatic, I would argue, in generic terms, not talking about COVID-19 specifically, is the relationship with the World Trade Organization, for instance, by blocking the appointment of judges to the dispute set appellate body uh, of the dispute settlement body of the WTO. Uh, one thing that we know is that no liberal trade order can survive without the strong support of the leading nations. The United States in the post-World War II period have consistently played this role. Lately, this is not the case. So I'm not as optimistic. I hope Doug is right, but I like very much what Ariana Suassuna, a Brazilian writer, once said that uh, the optimist is a naive person. The pessimist is a bore. And uh, he said, I would like to be a realist with hope. So at this point in time, I still have hopes, but uh, obviously the current situation doesn't help. Thank you very much, Carlo, for your intervention. Doug, do you have a rejoinder? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, look, uh, yeah, maybe uh, realism with hope is, uh, is not a bad way forward. Um, I, if you look around the world, I mean, we have in Asia, uh, some seeds of, um, of uh, pushback emerging. We have already in place, um, as of uh, the end of December 2018, we have um, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, anchored now by Japan, um, uh, with 10 other members, a $10 trillion area of GDP um, that uh, these 11 countries have removed um, most uh, tariffs, uh, they've liberalized the service sector um, uh, market access in, a, in a, quite a dramatic way, in my opinion. They tackled non-tariff barriers, regulatory barriers to trade. So th there is some coalition pushing back. Um, uh, and we have um, now uh, in the final stages of negotiation, the regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in Asia. It's a it's a, um, a, a lighter trade agreement. It's focused mainly on duties and uh, some investment facilitation. I, um, uh, but that could be concluded this year um, with uh, 15 members across Asia, um, anchored by ASEAN, the 10 ASEAN countries, um, uh, in partnership with uh, uh, China, Japan, Korea. Um, Australia and New Zealand. So, um, you know, I, I'm thinking uh, there's some hope here. There's some hope uh, in this. Um, uh, and I think as these um, uh, large regional blocks move forward, um, uh, they create incentives for others to join. And to, um, if they get, if we get sufficient scale in RCEP or in CPTPP, or even the European Union with its bilateral trade agreements that it's been building out. Um, um, most recent, I mean, some substantial recent uh, deals, including EU-Japan, EU-Canada, um, and now we've got coming online, hopefully in the next few months, will be ratified um, the uh, uh, EU-Vietnam deal. Uh, EU-Singapore came online last November. So we've got these various um, uh, bilateral bridges being built by the EU as well. I guess where I'm headed with this is we need to see uh, Latin America more engaged, uh, in my opinion. Um, the EU Mercosur draft deal um, is a starting point, but it's not actionable yet. It needs to be advanced. We have uh, uh, Peru and Chile that's uh, along with Mexico who signed the CPTPP agreement, but only Mexico has ratified it. It's low hanging fruit for Peru or for Chile to ratify that deal and to gain access um, to an expanded Pacific Basin market, um, uh, including Japan, access to the Japanese market there. So there's some pushback. There's a coalition of countries. Right now it's fragmented, but I'm looking forward to seeing this 
uh, rest of world coalition um, uh, consolidate some of these gains and push forward on the leading edge fronts. And uh, I think that'll get the attention of uh, countries that may be um, pulling back from the multilateral approaches, um, uh, such as the US in time, because these things are starting to gain some scale. Um, but we have to, you know, um, uh, I have to be a, a hopeful realist perhaps in, in that these things will stay on the rails and be followed through to uh, uh, logical, economically valid, you know, socially um, uh, accountable fashion to conclusion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. And Laura. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to agree with Doug. I'm also a hopeful realist. Um, I think uh, the companies that I work with, global companies who source globally, manufacture globally, import and export worldwide, um, I think they are already taking advantage of the regional agreements that Doug mentioned. I think they will increasingly do so, whether the United States decides to participate. And I, you know, we'll see what happens there. Um, I think there will be those bilateral agreements. Um, you know, for the US, but I think global companies are taking advantage of those agreements and they will do more so. Um, for most companies, they will maintain diversification in their supply chains, look to do so more. Um, I don't think retrenchment back into the US is the answer for most companies, maybe for specific products, you know, for specific industries, um, but certainly not for most. And I think um, for the American consumer, more now than ever, um, Americans like to shop, you know, with Amazon and Walmart, and to do so requires diversification of supply chains. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you very much, Laura, Carlos, and Doug. Really excellent. I would just add one thing, and this goes back to when I started working, actually prompted by Carlos, Dr. Braga, on when the United States started its first bit of uh, activist reciprocity that went to more regional type agreements like NAFTA instead of bilateral. The problem with a, you know, a hodgepodge of bilaterals is that it's, it's extremely costly, not only in trade diversion, but for a company. How are you, if you're gonna do world trade, how are you gonna go across all the different areas? And of course, that, especially with different content rules, et cetera, uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, and second, it's another way to game, uh, game it. And certainly the, the Asian countries are setting themselves up to become a major beneficiary of the situation because they have a regional agreement that's quite open. So uh, I think the cost will mount, certainly some of the costs and the pushback on the aggressive reciprocity that we've seen over the last couple of years in the United States uh, led to pushback. And I think in this case, we will also have uh, the same thing. So there's a dynamic that both Carlos, all three panelists uh, outlined very well. And I think we're not gonna be sitting right in one place. And I think the, the cost will mount. The other thing is uh, all of you described a situation where Brazil can benefit massively, especially it's starting from a relative protectionist uh, position and can and the forces of opening seem to be still there. And certainly this administration under their finance minister has a bias for opening markets. And I think very much the benefit of Brazil, not only its size, but its location, et cetera. So um, again, I wanted to thank all the panelists for a great panel. Also the Fundação Dom Cabral for being our partner in this. Um, we have another webinar on Thursday and on Friday. We have on Thursday our, our, our sixth installment on, on, on surviving COVID-19 uh, with not-for-profits. Uh, and then on Friday in, in conjunction with PwC, we have uh, a, 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 a webinar on tax function and really at the corporate level what uh, uh, what uh, companies faced and how they're resolving it. So thank you very much. We will have this uh, a link to the recording for this online, even though we couldn't uh, um, uh, do it live. And I want to thank all the panelists for more time and all of you for joining me. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you on Thursday, hopefully. <laughs>